I don't know if I should begin from the beginning, but uh, <laughs> I probably will not. So, uh, uh, so anyhow, uh, so here is a question. Uh, is there a constant such as the length of a shortest periodic geodesic? On a closed Riemannian manifold? Uh, of dimension n uh, bounded in terms of n root of volume. n is a dimension. Okay, so uh, this is a question. Is there such constant? Uh, and the, uh, in all generality, the answer is not known although there are many partial results, uh, which I uh, will not mention, but probably most of you know them, and uh, I do not want to give a survey talk. But in any case, so if uh, we could have proven this theorem, that would be an effective version of the um, uh, Lusternic fat theorem, fat Lusternic, right, of the existence theorem. So if we could have proven it, it would give us a quantitative version of um, existence theorem of uh, Fiat and Lusternic. And the theorem says that on any closed Riemannian manifold, There exists at least one periodic geodesic. And then we notice that uh, there are actually many questions of uh, this type that we can ask. Well, so for example, Gromov was interested in the uniform bound in terms of the volume. But one can be uh, as interested, so maybe let me call this one, and let me call this one prime, uh, in the bound in terms of diameter. So is there And that would also be, right, if we could prove something like this, that would also be an effective version of the uh, FET and Dysternic theorem, but uh, that's also, in all generality, that's also not known. Okay, so uh, what, are the, what are the questions can we ask? Well, we can ask, we can ask the same questions about, uh, rather than asking about the estimating the length of a periodic geodesic, we can ask them about uh, estimating the length of stationary geodesicness. Okay, so uh, same questions, right? I mean, can we bound them in terms of the volume of the manifold? Can we bound them in terms of the diameter of the manifold? Uh, so ge stationary geodesic nets are graphs, something like this, right? Each edge is a geodesic, and at each vertex we have the stationarity conditions that when we look at the unit vectors that are emerging from the vertex, uh, the sum is zero. And they are a critical points of the length functional on the space of graphs. So here the answer is known. Uh, so Alex and I, we have proven that uh, such bounds exist. <coughs> okay. 
Now we also can consider high, gen uh, high dimensional generalizations of these questions. Now there are um, well-known existence theorems for um, minimal surfaces, so minimal hypersurfaces. So one notable example of such existence is the existence theorem So those are minimal surfaces. Of pit. And uh, let me also mention the recent result of uh, uh, Fernanda Cora Marquez and Andrew Nevish. So there is existence theorem for many um, minimal surfaces that's due to, which is very recent. Uh, and uh, now there are effective, uh, there are quantitative versions of uh, these results as well. So there are effective versions of the existence theorem of Pitt that are independently due to uh, Parker, Glyn, Eddy, and Evgeny Lyakumovich. And also, so those are co-authors, and they independently to Stefan Saburu. And also effective versions of existing serum of uh, uh, Kora Marquez and uh, Nevesh uh, that are due to Evgeny Lyakumovich. With Parker Glinady. I think, I forget, maybe. Okay, so, uh, well, that was uh, an introduction. Uh, actually, what I want to talk is about uh, effective version of the uh, lusternic schneerman serum. So, uh, here is the lusternic schneerman serum. says that on any Riemannian two sphere, uh, there exist three distinct simple non-trivial uh, periodic geodetics. Okay. And we would like to estimate, uh, so now we would like to estimate their length. Okay. So the question is uh, whether you can estimate the length of those periodic geodetics in terms of the diameter of, uh, of your manifold. Okay, and the, uh, the answer that we have obtained is Evgeny Lyakumovich and Alex is that you indeed can do this. So here is the theorem that we are, I'm going to prove. Okay, so uh, let M be a 
Ionian 2 sphere. of diameter D. Then there exists three distinct simple periodic geodesics. of length at most 20D. OK, so let me mention that um, 20D, 20 times the diameter. Uh, let me mention that, uh, firstly, uh, some time ago, Croke has uh, found the first estimate of the length of a periodic geodesic on the Riemannian two sphere. So he found his original estimates was the following. He found that the length of a periodic geodesic on the Riemannian two sphere is bounded by nine times the diameter. He did not worry about geodesics being simple. And he also found that it's less than or equal to 31 square root of area. Now, later on, uh, this result was improved by Maeda to 5D. And uh, we have, with Alex, have noticed that it's easy enough to show that uh, this geodesic that he estimates just modifying his proof a little bit, we can make it to be simple. So we also found that so there is one of length less than or equal to 5D. And we also have found that there is uh, the second one of length less than or equal to 10D. And with Evgeny, he helped us to estimate the third one. OK, so 20D. OK, so how do we prove something like this? Usually, we start with the existence theorem. And the existence theorem uses more theory. Um, well, in this case, uh, on the space of non-parameterized uh, curves on L. So um, we consider something like this. going to consider relative homology with Z2 coefficients. Now, this is just simply uh, the space of constant curves. So actually, those are just points on the manifold. It can be identified with M. OK? Now, uh, just for simplicity, let me, so M is a Riemannian to sphere. But let me just, uh, to begin with, to sp speak about the standard sphere. So let's consider a round sphere. Now, Lusternik and Schneerlmann construct three representatives of the homology classes of, uh, in this space. OK? So um, what is Z1? So Z1 is like this. We look at the round sphere. And we start slicing the sphere by planes that are parallel to the XD plane. OK? And this is what we obtain. OK? So everybody understands what this class is? It's rather simple, right? So this is Z1. That's a representative in the, in, of uh, some one-dimensional homology class. Now, how do we obtain Z2? So again, I'm considering on, on a round sphere. 
Okay, so the two we obtained was the following means. We are going to take this family, we're going to rotate it by pi. Okay? So we're going to have all those circles we used to have. But we also start rotating and we're going to obtain those ones. And we continue. Okay, and uh, if I draw any more of those, then it's not going to be comprehensible at all. Okay, so we rotate it until we get, well, essentially, geometrically the same circle with different orientation, but we're considering unparameterized curves. Okay, so this is D2. Now, uh, this three actually is very easy to describe, not even going to draw a picture, because the three simply take all circles on a sphere. Okay, so uh, of course we're dealing with the Riemannian sphere. We're not dealing with the round sphere. So uh, we are just looking at the classes that are induced by this D1, D2, D3, and diffeomorphism between S2 and M. So uh, Lusternik and Schneerlmann uh, have um, shown that if you apply, so let me call those classes U1, U2, U3. Okay, so uh, let's say this is phi m. Now, the story and Schneelman have shown that uh, here we have Z1 maybe. This is uh, U1. Here is U2. Here is U3. So suppose we apply a, a curve, some curve shortening flow, right? Then they're going to get stuck on periodic geodesics. Um, now they sort of have shown that those periodic geodesics have to be simple because the curve shortening that they were trying to develop does not uh, develop self-intersections. Uh, the proof was uh, not quite correct. It was later corrected by, uh, by Joost. Somebody else, I remember, Taimanov. Or one can uh, alternatively use theorem of Grayson. And uh, I think if we use a, a sort of uh, a curve shortening by uh, Haas and Scott, that's going to work as well, okay? So now, so uh, we, we apply this uh, uh, curve shortening flow, we get stuck on periodic geodesics. Now, uh, it's possible that they might get stuck on the same geodesic, but then, um, Lusternik and Schneerman have shown that we are going to get the whole critical level of those geodesics. So in the worst case scenario, we're going to have three distinct periodic geodesics. And now, if we sort of look at this picture, we see that those geodesics are, with respect to the length functional, they sit below each of those representatives. So if um, we can estimate the length of each curve through which this class passes, that will give us an upper bound on the length of a periodic geodesic. Now, if we look at this picture here, right, I mean, that of course is nice, but if you look at our manifold and the corresponding picture in our manifold, the manifold can look fairly strange. I mean, this is not even the worst case scenario. If we now try to draw a similar picture here, so if we attempt to slice our manifold, well, I mean, we run into problem, right? I mean, the curves can become very long and not quite clear how we can control the lengths here. So it is in fact a little bit convenient to instead of Z1, Z2, Z3, consider homologous classes. Okay, so I'm going to call them C1, C2, C3, and I'm going to homologous, so C1 is going to be homologous to Z1, C2 to 
G2 and C3 to D3. So let me describe those classes. So, uh, <clears throat> let me again sort of look at the round sphere. Now, let me consider a meridional sweep out of the sphere. Now, uh, this is how I'm going to describe C1. Let me fix first um, a meridian. And now I'm going to consider all the meridians which make angle alpha, well, the same angle, this is given meridian. Okay? So I'm going to start with this meridian sort of going back and forth along it. And I'm going to unfold it and it's going to come back at the back. Okay, so there are two things uh, to, um, to see here. Well, firstly, well, here I don't have curves without self-intersection, so it's not good, but uh, it's easy to uh, sort of move them a little bit and you will have curves that don't have self-intersection, something like this. Okay, so I, I hope this picture clear, right? I mean, so we start with this and then we unfold it and we come around, okay? So um, this is the same as uh, Z1. I mean, I think uh, uh, sort of intuitively it's sort of clear, but I can do a little bit better. I mean, we simply can already remember that before we just had those circles. Now, instead of each of those circles, I'm considering a meridian that touches a circle like this. And then notice that I can deform the circle into meridian. I can do it continuously with respect to those circles. So uh, what I obtain is a homologous cycle. Now, instead of C2, well, remember that uh, here I have taken this and rotated it by pi. So uh, I'm going to do the same here. So I'm going to take this green meridian and rotate it, and the whole family is going to get rotated with it. So in fact, the second cycle is just four pairs of meridians here. So if I consider any pair like this, okay, that's going to be in a cycle. So this is going to be C2. Okay, so uh, C3 is a little bit more difficult. So firstly, let me explain what it consists of. This is going to be C3. I am going to fix a meridian. I'm going to take a pair of meridians that make the same angle with this given meridian. And I'm going to take another pair of meridians that are somewhere in the back, okay? That make also the same angle with this given meridian. Well, I can continue it, right? I mean, so somewhere in the back, there will be, or well, maybe it don't have to be in the back. I mean, there'll be something like this. A different angle, but still the same. Okay, so my curve actually looks like this. I mean, again, so it, it sort of looks like a curve with self-intersection, but again, you know, we can move it a little bit and it's going to and, uh, get rid of self-intersections. And then I'm going to rotate this meridian. Okay, so, um, now, again, so why uh, is this the same essentially as these three? Well, one way to see it is this, right? I mean, so uh, remember that these three are simply all circles on a sphere. Now, I can take a circle on a sphere. I can trap it by something like this. So, uh, uh, so this is a south pole on a sphere. So I can trap it by something like this. Those are two circles that touch my given circle in the lowest point and the highest point. And then I can stretch them out. Well, I'm waving my hands a little bit and actually there is some te technical details we have to deal with here. Okay, so uh, now that I have this, uh, what do I care, right? I mean, so the fact of the matter is this, right? I mean, suppose I have my diffeomorphism from S2 to M. 
And suppose I can estimate the maximum length of f of a meridian. OK? If I can do something like this, that will give me uh, all three upper bounds. So in fact, what I'm attempting to do, I have here this sphere, M, right? I'm attempting to construct a sweep out, a slicing really, of uh, M into those type of curves. OK? So if I can do this, I'd be in a good shape. Now, here's the problem that in general it's not possible to do. In general, like if you're taking, suppose we, we, we have an arbitrary Riemannian two sphere, then we cannot hope to sweep out the sphere by short curves. All right, so that uh, was proven by, so there is no, short in general, I should say in general. There is no short diameter sweep out or slicing, well sweep out as well, of M by meridians. Uh, which was shown by Evgeny Lyakumovich. Uh, but is, uh, uh, so he's, uh, he constructed a family of metrics on um, which we cannot do this, uh, which is based really strongly on the example of Frankel and Katz. And so uh, if we cannot do this, then what, what do we hope for? Well, we hope that what prevents uh, us from, being sweep, uh, from, from, from constructing a sweep out of M by short uh, meridians is the existence of short, simple periodic geodesics. OK? So uh, this is how it works. Now, uh, at the beginning, we sort of follow the idea of Croc. And the idea of Croc is to take two points P and Q and M that are diameter apart. <clears throat> so uh, here is M. Uh, in fact, let me draw it like this. I mean, it's not a round sphere. It can look uh, very nasty indeed, but uh, it's just simple to draw. So here we have P and Q. We are going to take points that are diameter apart, and uh, we are going to uh, say that there is a um, finitely many geodesics. In fact, uh, we probably make them, the number to be less than five, I think less than or equal to five. So there will be geodesics that look like this. Okay, so this is tau one, tau two, tau n. So um, it follows from Berger lama. that there exists geodesics tau 1, tau n. So those are minimal geodesics. And those geodesics uh, break this m, the manifold, into a convex domain. So if I consider. a domain bounded by tau 1, tau 2, those angles are going to be less than pi. And well, for any tau i, tau i plus 1 is going to be true. 
So uh, at each point, the geodesics are going to be coming from every direction. If it's not true, right? I mean, we can move this point, and uh, this is going to be by uh, by the uh, variational formula is going to contradict the fact that those are diameter apart. Okay. So um, okay, so fine. So now we have this number of geodesics, and if we can extrapolate between each of the pair, right? I mean, so we take each pair. This is, well, I have it here. If we can uh, sort of come up with curves that connect those points P and Q that very smoothly from tau, tau sub i to tau sub i plus one, they are of short lengths, and this is what we're looking for. Okay? So here's how we are going to do this. So firstly, let us consider this as a closed curve. So this is, so we're going to consider the curve tau sub i followed by tau sub i plus one, where we follow it in the opposite direction. We apply, uh, let's say, Birkhoff curve shortening, okay? Now, in this case, the Birkhoff curve shortening is not going to develop any self-intersection. And there are two possibilities. One possibility is that, uh, so there is case one, that we will get stuck on the periodic geodesic. Um, so this is case one. Uh, this is maybe not the best possible scenario, but we have our first geodesic, NS of length at most 2D. And we have case two, where we can simply uh, apply the Birkhoff curve shortening and we contract to a point. Okay, so this is sort of a good case. Now, because we can now construct our meridians in the following way. Well, so uh, we are going to connect. I'm not going to struggle to obtain the best possible balance. Actually, that requires a little bit more work than I'm going to demonstrate here. But we are going to take this point. We are going to connect it by, let's say this is point X. We are going to connect it by minimizing geodesic. Maybe let me call it the gamma. Okay. Uh, and... Um, my meridians are going to look like this. So the general meridian is going to look like this. It's going to look like, so we come along gamma, then we circle around a curve in the homotopy, then we return back, and then we follow tau sub i, okay? So really we start with tau sub i, we go like this, at some point, the curve that we are going to obtain is this. So it's going to go um, along tau sub i plus one. It's going to then return along tau sub i. And then it's going to trace this almost back. And then we can contract it to a point. And we will end up with tau sub i plus one. Those are going to be the meridians, okay? Now, uh, so this is a case, uh, case one. Case one is good because uh, then if we can do it for all pairs of tau sub i, tau sub i plus one, then we're going to be done, okay? Now, uh, what do we do in case two? Okay, so in case two, what we're going to do is the following. So um, here the problem is that we get stuck on the periodic geodesic, and we're happy that we have this periodic geodesic, and we're a little bit unhappy that there's only one periodic geodesic. So let us consider a point that is furthest from the boundary inside this domain. So let me call it X. 
And then there is an analog of Berger's lemma that we can prove that we can come up with minimal geodesics that will come in all directions. And so here we have new domains, okay? And now we apply uh, curve shortening to each of those curves, right? And the situation is the same. Either we get stuck on the periodic geodesic or we contract to a point. Okay, so we get stuck on the periodic geodesic. That's going to be geodesic number two. Okay, and uh, then we can repeat. Okay, do the same thing. If we don't get stuck on the periodic geodesic, then uh, we can actually contract this curve in a nice way. Okay, so let me uh, sort of demonstrate how we can do it. Um, I'll let me call this alpha one. This is going to be alpha two, alpha three. And this is going to be maybe tau prime one, tau prime two, tau prime three. Okay, so uh, we can take this, keep those points homotopy at two. So alpha one is path homotopic. I'll draw this in a second. to alpha three star alpha two, uh, three short curves. And if we have this, and we can actually contract this to a point in a reasonable way. Uh, so this is a homotopy, right? I mean, so we, we already see that uh, we can start with alpha one, and we can move from this to a curve like this. This is going to be tau one star tau two. Okay, from here, we can pass to this curve. Uh, it's going to look like this. So it's going to be alpha three, followed by tau two, followed by tau three, and then we can move this. So the curve will look like this. And finally, we contract this. Okay, so uh, there can be some criticism uh, about this proof uh, because uh, if you remember, if you look at the proof uh, of lusternik schneerelmann it gives us uh, periodic geodesics of index greater than zero. And we do not necessarily obtain periodic geodesics of index greater than zero. There can be some uh, geodesics of, uh, that, are, that are minimizing, lo locally minimizing. So, uh, in fact, if we would like to obtain honest to God Lusternik Schneerelmann's geodesics, we really need the sweep out, okay? And as I said before, if we just want to have a sweep out in terms of the diameter, that's, uh, we, we will not be able to do this, okay? However, if we would like if now to use something else, if we would like, if we allow ourselves to use the area, then the sweep out is possible. And so in this case, we really can estimate the length of lusternik schneerman geodesics. So let me write this down. <clears throat> so this is serum two. So again, M is Riemannian two sphere. Uh, of area A and diameter D. There exist three distinct simple periodic geodesics of length 
less than 800D max 1. natural log squared A divided by D. Um, and the index of all of them is greater than zero. So, uh, now, as you might have noticed, uh, uh, if we would like to obtain bounds like this, I mean, it's true uh, for minimal surfaces as well. We really would like to construct sweep outs. Now, my experience uh, with constructing sweep outs by closed curves, that you can do it if you can construct a curve as a loop over short loops. So, in general, right, I mean, there are no minimal objects to prevent it. You can construct a short curve as a free curve to a point, right? But uh, if you want to construct curves like this over base point loops, then this is difficult. <clears throat> so that's why I will, uh, would like also to mention the following theorem that I really like. So this is a joint result with Greek chambers. Um, let me write it down. This is theorem So let M let me say the theorem one. Let M be a Riemannian two disk. of diameter D. Suppose there is a homotopy between the boundary and some point P. Uh, over three loops. Of length at most L. Then for any point in the boundary, and any small epsilon, there exists a uh, fixed point homotopy that connects the boundary with Q. Over loops based at Q, uh, of length at most Uh, D is the diameter. I don't know if I stated it before I did. Okay, so uh, this is theorem one, and I'm not going to write the whole statement for theorem two. But uh, it also works for uh, surfaces, right? I mean, if you have a simple closed curve on a surface, it also is going to work. Uh, but then the bound is going to be 
L plus three uh, L plus two D plus epsilon. Okay. So, um, well, let me draw a picture of, uh, uh, let me explain the question a little bit better, and uh, I'll see if I can tell you a little bit about the proof in five minutes. So, um, so this is the, well, possibly a Riemannian 2 disk can look like this, like a long finger. Now we have a boundary. Now uh, it's actually easy to see that in this case, it's easy to contract the boundary to a point over short curves. Now if we insist on fixing this point, then uh, I mean we can do something, right? I mean we can uh, go like this. But uh, you can see that uh, twice the diameter will have to enter. Okay, so if we insist of on fixing the point, then uh, we have to take the diameter into account. Now, uh, and so if you look at the picture like this, then it, it seems that the uh, answer to the question is sort of trivial. Okay, but it's not because uh, this is a relatively nice metric on a two disk. And uh, what if it looks something like this? Okay, so that's also a two disk. And believe it or not, that's not the worst case scenario either, okay? So, um, now uh, let me sort of demonstrate, I mean, the, the first you ask yourself this question, right? I mean, this question did arise in actually trying to uh, prove some theorem, right? I mean, so when you, the first you ask yourself this question, then you sort of imagine the picture like this. So sure, right? I mean, so you have a homotopy of the boundary, right? It goes along short curves. Now let's choose a point. Let's, so this is the point to which the homotopy converges, right? Let's connect it by a geodesic, maybe like this, okay? This is a minimizing geodesic that connects the point on the boundary with the point to which it converges. Uh, and let's just uh, look at the fixed point homotopy that looks something like this. Right, I mean, we follow tau, we go around, and then we return. Okay, and then we can follow it. Maybe, maybe we'll come back to the same curve, it doesn't matter. Right, I mean, still follow it and return back. But the homotopy doesn't have to look like this. I mean, actually, the homotopy of the boundary might look something like this. So let's start with a disk. And firstly, some self-intersections can develop. Uh, also, not only some self-intersections can develop, but we can have something like this, right? And so here, we have converged to this point, okay? Or maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a point somewhere here, just to make it more interesting. So we have converged to this point. Here, let's join it by minimizing geodesic. Where does it get us? Actually, nowhere. We cannot continuously follow it, right? So that's a problem. So, uh, well, what do we do in this case? Well, there are two things to be done. First, we have to get rid of self-intersections. And second, we have to get rid, so in order for us to be able to contract this curve as a loop, we have to do, it, it appears, two things. First, we have to get rid of curves which have self-intersection. And second, we would, don't want to have the situation like this. We don't want that curves intersect each other. That we also don't like. Now, uh, getting rid of self-intersections, that actually was done by um, uh, Evgeny and uh, Greg. So by uh, Greg Chambers and uh, Evgeny Lyakumovich. So here is, so, so the first step is the following theorem of Chambers and Lyakumovich. So uh, it says that on a Riemannian surface, uh, suppose we have a simple closed curve. So 
suppose there is a homotopy. <coughs> between gamma of t and some point p that passes through curves of length at most L. Then for any small epsilon, there exists a new homotopy between gamma and p, some other point of tilde, uh, that over simple closed curves. Of length at most L plus epsilon. Okay, so uh, this is first step, uh, and now uh, I can, um, well, I'm out of time, but I can describe to you the original idea that does not work, okay? So now uh, we, with the help of uh, Greg and Evgeny, we start with the homotopy of the boundary, and now the homotopy can look something like this, but no self-intersections. So how do we, get rid of the intersections between curves. Well, the original idea is this, right? I mean, so we would like, because we would like to uh, have the bound in terms of uh, the original length L, we are sort of obliged to use pieces of uh, those curves. So let's suppose, let's suppose we look at a discrete situation. Okay, so instead of uh, this continuous family of curves, let's say we have curves alpha 1, alpha 2, a sequence of curves, alpha sub n. Okay, so now this is maybe alpha sub 1, this is alpha sub 2. Okay, so um, we're not happy how it looks, right? We actually would like that this will be our new picture. This is alpha sub, sub one new, and this is alpha, alpha sub two new. Okay, so what are we not happy about? Well, here is alpha sub one. Here, we're not happy like, for instance, about this. Right, I mean, it sticks out, we don't want this. So we can look at this particular piece and we can compare the length, okay? So either this length is bigger or this length is, uh, either this length is smaller or this length is smaller. If this length is smaller, then in our new homotopy, both curves will become this green curve here. It just follows the smaller one. If this length is smaller, then both curves will become this red curve. Okay? Now this idea doesn't work. I mean, it's the original idea and it has our, uh, its use in our proof. But it doesn't work for the following reason. I mean, the intersections can be actually kind of nasty. Maybe they look like this, okay? And then what do we do, okay? Uh, but that's all I can say, so I'm going to stop. Uh, so, well, there's some, well, I mean, minimal S, uh, S2 in S3, 